Yeah, that's true. But as I said, it, it, the, the issue isn't, isn't the access. I mean, they provide a good service in some respects, but um, it's the fact is Google don't value, they don't value the content. <laughs> this is the point. They don't want to pay for the content. They're happy to show it. They're happy to make money from it. But they just don't want to pay for everyone it. Everyone trying to cut their costs. Yeah. Well, you can generate money with the, the ads. It's such a small amount of money. Yeah. Good news, I mean, I've got adverts on my music videos. I don't make any money. Anyway, and this... Do you, do you know, can I say one thing? Do you know the category that pays the least on YouTube? What? It's music, in it? <laughs> Courses. <laughs> Courses. <laughs> you know what one of the most popular categories is on YouTube? Gaming, probably. <laughs> Cats Den <then> Music. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's get cats in all music videos from now on. I'll get a cat there playing a guitar. Go. Especially if you can get a cat that frowns, then you're then you're you're onto a winner. So just a quick since that disruption, the last slide I showed you, these are all the different music services that are flooded into the market, mainly online. Bit confusing where to go and who to engage with and why and what they can do for you and and again, really, what do we really want to be doing? Just making music and creating music and performing. But yeah, we have to try and engage with all this stuff as well, just to get anywhere. That is, he's not a nice man, but it was a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> if something is going to happen in the end, you may as well do it in the beginning. He was probably talking about bombing some kids or something, I don't know. But, um, Consumer trends such as streaming and mobile phones should be seen and acted upon. So mobile's where it's going. Everyone kind of knows that. We're at the beginning of it. We know it's going to be where it ends. How are we engaging with that medium? Should we be? What should we be doing? <coughs> and again, an interesting fact, the total number of streams in 2013, 3.7 billion is more than the total number of singles sold in 60 years. Maybe this is something we should be engaging with too. Well, it's the change of the cost structure. Now you pay every time you listen, rather than purchasing and then having unlimited listening. You don't own it anymore, so you're paying for access. You're right, yeah. It's an access model, that's where it's moving to. Well, that's where it is, it's not where it's moving to. There we go. You preempted my slide. You only own a piece of plastic. You didn't own the music on it before either. That's true. You're right. You're absolutely right. But you could sell the piece of plastic legally. You can't sell a download even if you buy it. Before, you know, you know, you know, all the, the music that as well in the, in the CD set, you own this. The medium. Mm. Yeah. When, yeah. When you buy you the media. Like the, the vinyl. So it's not going to spread. They said to you, you are not owing the music. That's why you can't share it. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. You only owned the physical medium. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a, there was an interesting court case that was going on. Bruce Willis was taking Apple to court. I don't know if anyone heard about this. I think they settled. And um, he basically said, well, I've been buying all this music. When I die, I want to leave it to my daughter. Why can't I? because you're paying for access, just because you paid for it and downloaded it, you don't own it. When you die, your iTunes account dies and that's it, it's gone. Most people don't know that either around the music they're buying, but that's the legal position. So, a question. So, what do you own? Access. That's it. You're allowed to log in and listen. And when you log off... You go to the gym and <laughs> you have access to the gym and ever the infrastructure, but then you don't own, you cannot go on with like the weights. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good example. You, you, you own your arms, arms and your muscles, muscles. That's, that's about, about it. it. <laughs> so you own your ears, <laughs> but that's about it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. That's right. No, you pay access to the service. That, that's it. So you, you're not even paying, you just pay literally to just say, I can listen to that and that's all. 
which I think what you said. So what does that mean? Is that going in the right direction, do you think? It's just, I'm just stating where we are. I mean, it's how you see, you might see it as terrible, you might see it as great. It just is what it is. It's, for the artists, it's, these are things we have to consider when we're looking at redesigning our business model and the way we do things. We have to look at where we are now and where things are now and almost look at where they're going to go. And this is where it's going. It's going to access and it's going to access through certain channels. New channels will come up, new channels will die, old channels will die, but this model will carry on, I think, pretty much for a while. It's yeah. a very important question to me. I know it's not stupid, sure. but you said uh, about uh, Bruce Willis and uh, uh, Apple. Mm. Okay, he, he took Apple to court because what? I don't understand. They don't he wanted to write the right to own his downloads he'd paid for. But the downloads are inside a computer, mm. so you can still use a memo stick and put it into your memo stick. Yeah, of course, yeah. Legally, yeah. you can't. Yeah, it's still, it's illegal. You yeah. Can't. yeah. He, he will do that in the yeah. end. He'll probably do it and no one will know. I mean, you got music, documents, yeah. iTunes library, you drag the folder. I and iTunes is stored you within the program of iTunes. Only, <coughs> only you have the legal access to that music. You, nobody else is supposed to be able to listen to that music. You're not supposed to give it to anyone. All of that is illegal. <laughs> and it's important to understand this as well because you've got to think if, you, if you're working with iTunes I'm not saying you shouldn't or you should I'm just telling you how it is then as soon as you sign that dotted line then your music becomes part of that system where even you can't give it to someone just like that even if you've made it Depends on what sort of deal you've got. You could just give it to them. You couldn't. You couldn't take it from your. You couldn't take it from your iTunes account, no. Yes, you could go around it, but. It's the same with Amazon and um, Google Play. Google Play is Amazon, definitely yes. Google Play is similar, but they have a bit more flexible. Google. Uh, I mean, I download CDs from Amazon, mm. and uh, so that's just mine. I, it's just my access. I, mean, I wouldn't be able to pass it to anyone. Mm. But I mean, I know Amazon used to give you a copy on a hard copy as well, didn't they? I don't know if they still do that. Oh, no. They don't do that anymore. Oh, okay, okay. I don't know. All of this protection like, is under the banner of the right Technically, yeah. no. Sorry, the IT is my, my forte. Um, basically, just to answer what you said earlier, because Amazon, if you do it straight from the website, still gives you the MP3 file straight up, the illegality is not with you sharing it, it's with you copying it. And obviously there is an implication that when you copy it, you've created two products without paying the people who obviously sold you that product their ro royalties. So in all cases and situations, you just have to simply look at it as, okay, how many copies are in the system? Um, do I have the right to give my license to listen to this to someone else, which you don't? And um, when I do share it to other people, are the original creators getting their royalties? And in most cases, that's no. So in most cases, when we're, even when, if I've got two iPods and I put it on both of them, technically, I'm doing wrong. That's why copyright law is really, really, really behind where it needs to be right now. Yeah, in that case, if you are paying for access, and you pay for your access, and you have two iPods or three, you're, you're outside of, that's outside of the domain of Apple's liability. Okay, so basically, once you have it, it's your legal responsibility to, to obey those rules. Apple's not going to try and restrict you because they don't care. Because at the end of the day, if someone was really, really arcane and, and went down and sort of dropped the hammer on you he your head and tried to take you to court for these things, Apple would have no responsibility to have made sure that you did not illegally copy your work. So, yeah, that's where we're at. That, that is where we're at. 
it's not a bad news, mind. It's just recognizing where we are. This is what this is about. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just what it is. So, let's look at the role of music in people's lives, something that most people love. I haven't met anyone who doesn't like music, actually. Have you? Really? I haven't met anyone. They just don't like music, full stop. They don't nod their head if something comes on TV. No. Wow, yeah. strange. Do they have ears? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so pe most people love, no one dislikes, and it touches everyone throughout their lives. So that's the value of what you guys do. That's the real value there. It's pretty huge when you think no one wants to pay for it now. It's, that's pretty huge value. I mean, there's stuff that I buy every day that doesn't make me feel like that, or can, can, I couldn't describe like that. <laughs> so, back to the business model. Big D. She's a classical music director. She wants to attract youth. Who are her customers? Parents? Great answer, I like that. Parents. <laughs> posh parents? All right, posh parents. I'll put, I'll put posh in brackets. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I'm, no, I'm not going to put posh. That's a bit wrong. Let's not put posh. It's just parents who like classical music. Let's put that, yeah. Who else? Schools. Uh, schools, workshops, you mean sort of music projects, that sort of thing? Yeah, like summer schools. Yeah. Music projects, venues. When I'm doing customer segments, I like to, um, and when I run the workshop in this, I normally say to people, Keep thinking of potential customers till you run out. Even if you're, not, you're never going to sell to that person, write it down anyway. It's about understanding the potential for your product, service, or whatever it is you do. One at the back. So, theatre goers, should we call them? Buyers, ticket buyers. Because yeah. <laughs> otherwise I feel bad yeah. for these kids and with all these parents and teachers yeah. shoving classical music out <laughs> no matter how good people they may be. And they might hate it. They might hate it. Yeah, they hate it. thank you. I, I agree with that. Let's put them there. Young Ticket people. shops. <laughs> Web. TV and radio. Oh, oh no, that's space. space. CBBC. <laughs> Let's go with that. I don't think young people count. What do they do? Do they buy anything? Young people, they're yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, they do. They're, they're, yeah. They're customers, buying customers. They're influencers. We use it. I suppose if you look at the people who don't know, they're teenagers do buy stuff. Mm. Is, if you think of classical music, sorry, if somebody goes Was to the theatre, you, you, you think like not very young people. Yeah. So, um, what I understand, Big D wants to be the star, so she can attract young people. So she plays in, like, I don't know, in the Royal Albert Hall, and it's full of 20, 20 years old people mm -hmm. that they go there not to see the music, just to see Big D. That's her strategy, right. or, or his strategy. And so, so you you think know, it doesn't Big matter D if it's Mozart or Beethoven or yeah. Brahms or whatever, mm -hmm. it's to go to see Big D. Yeah. Why? Because she's the coolest. Uh, there you go, I like that. Uh, the musical voice. director. So it's like the, she's selling you the experience to see this crazy uh, director who talks about, I don't know, whatever interest to young people. And right. if I were a big D, definitely I'm not targeting to parents because I don't want parents. I want to be the, the Rolling Stones of classical music. Mm. I want to say, um, you know. Yeah, great comment. I like that. Because you're, you're right, it's, um, you could engage with either, and it's going to be a completely different project based on who you engage with. 
the way you go around delivering it is going to change completely. I think it's Go on. I think it depends on your target audience. Yeah. Because, like you, know, like you were saying, um, youths, you know, if you're going to youth clubs, if you're going, to, I think if you have a target audience, like from, I don't know, 8 to, I don't know, 20 or something, or 8 to 16 or something, then you know that you're going to be focusing on those. Mm -hmm. um, but if your music is wide, like Big D, might, her, her music might, is it he or is she? It's a she, she, I think. So it might be wide. So yeah. in that respect, sh she's going to, have she's not going to just target like the parents she's going to target everyone she's not going to mm. have a strict target audience it's going to be a bit more open yeah sorry um i also think i mean if her goal is also to attract youth back to classical music then the young people should probably be the main focus like she has to mm. kind of uh, advertise herself as i'm big d i'm cool really cool and I play classical music which happens to be cool because I mm. propose it to you in a cooler way yes so the parents might like it or not but the the main point is to make it like to young people that are going to be to their mates like hey dude mm. big mm. day's cool yo <laughs> <laughs> Do, does this come in the middle segment when you define the value of the product and that's where you def understand who are you targeting to like yeah. the value of my product is adding coolness to classical music or adding uh, education for children so once you understand the value of what you're doing you can understand who you are yes it, in a way though but it's better to start with the who first because um what you're going to find is potentially all of these are right none of these are wrong often with your customer segment it's not just about who you engage with it's about who you choose not to engage with so you might be able to create a list of 20 people who potentially could be your customer for Big D's project. But you might only choose to engage with young people <coughs> and music projects. Mm -hmm. Or the young people and advertise, or a combination of all of them. Yeah. I think I'm stuck on it, but yeah. don't you need to know who, who you are first as an artist in order to understand who you're going instead of starting for who you're going and then becoming the, the artist? Why? It's a chicken and egg problem to it's, me. Yeah, it really <laughs> is. Um, One comes with the other, though. It, yeah. if, if the most important yeah. thing is... So, for example, if Big D's gone into this saying, um, I want to get classical music to the masses young people in London. So straight away she's identified who it's for. And the reasoning behind why she's doing it and who it's for kind of go together. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if she's suddenly presented with this opportunity and says, okay, who should I present this project to? Who could I potentially present this project to? It's a bit more of an analytical way of looking at it. Because like I said, you could keep going on and writing all of these and end up choosing going back to this. But at least you know the potential of who it is you could be engaging with outside of just the young people. But doesn't the music have to speak for itself? You know, doesn't the music have to speak for itself? Because, you know, if Big D is doing targeting all these people, but the music that the, the children can't, the youths can't identify with it, mm. then they're not going to find it cool. It's, it's That's true. You know, it's at the end of the day, you know, even though you're having target audience, and I think you'll mm. see that's important to have all the who you know, who you're targeting, but the music is still the most important thing to be able for the, for the person to buy. There's no point. You, Who's going to buy it though? I mean, but, I Who's mean, gonna buy it? the young say, people? Well, the young people are going to buy it, but they still are need they? to, well, <laughs> if you're, if you're saying, if, yeah, but it depends, it depends on what your, what your, what you're identifying your music as, mm. as well, because, you know, if you're a classical singer, you might, reinvent the classic you might do your music in a certain way mm. um and then obviously you're going to target but you do need to know who you are and how you're forming your music and what your music says and what it's about in order to put that forth mm. you know the comparison here is whether this is created before music, music is created this. absolutely that's why it's a chicken absolutely. and egg problem because really if you May, if you do a business plan and then decide based on the business plan, right, this is what our band's going to be like, then obviously all of this stuff, as we're doing it right now, 
can fully be put into function, um, into function as best we can. Mm. But obviously, if you've already got the music existing, then you have to turn around and say, okay, so who does this music appeal to? And it's going to give you a lot of your answers to start with. Right. Mm. Well, I think it, it would be interesting to try if this is going to be more specific. Well, I think if you're writing the music, sorry, if you're writing the music, that's where the... I understand what you're saying, but if you're writing the music, then you have more freedom to kind of create it to, um, to that audience. But if you're not writing the music and you're singing someone else's, so someone else is writing for you, then obviously you would have different structures in place. So, um, you know, it's... It, it, I mean, I think you would, no matter what your business is, you're going to start with your product or service knowing what it is you do. Yeah, I think you it's, have to you I have to start with that to, clearly, and you you can't do a business model without something. Oh yeah, to, I think it's important yeah. to know what you're doing and where you're yeah. going and what your but, music is and, yeah, how, and who your audience is. It's definitely definitely is important. But the danger is if you get so stuck on that that you say I do this for this sort of person, and That's, you kind of end up boxing yourself a bit because because yeah. then when you go to your revenue streams, where's the revenue coming from? If you've identified these and these alone. These are not paying for your music alone. These are not going to fund Big D's lifestyle. That's, yeah, that's the reason why I, I personally think it's best to be open. It's mm. best not to have a strict target audience, although you can aim it at, mm. you know, certain youths or whatever. You, I mean, there's so much people that listen to music. You mm. might end up having another generation that's listening to your music, and you, yeah. the one that you've targeted to mm. is not actually the one that responds. So That's true, but then we're creating a business model here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not, and from a creative aspect, that's nice. Yeah, we, we can just make it, put it out, and hope wherever it lands, they like it. And all of a sudden, wow, all these people love it. Wow, I'm making a little bit of money from it. It's great. But that's not, there's no structure in that. That's pretty random, <laughs> isn't it? You're just hoping, putting it out there and hoping. Well, it, it, I mean, it is. I mean, this is why I went over where the industry is now. People aren't paying for the music. That's the whole point. They pay for access to it. So this is why we have to have a business model around our creative product. Because how else do we convert that potential of that creative product into cash or whatever it is we want in return? We, we have to have that structure around it. We have to think of it differently. Because no longer are people paying for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Let me crack on. This is why we're here. We will take that up afterwards. So I'm going to say for now. Sorry. Oh, sorry. One more question. Um, sorry. Is it just me or is it slightly complicated, our example, that we've defined Big D as somebody who's trying to bring a product to the to the exact market that it would not normally go to. Does that not make this uh, more tricky. complex? Yeah. So why don't we just make the example like an easier example, more typical example. Uh, just to me, that would just be easier to understand. Because we don't even know if she writes her own music and she's trying to attract an audience that isn't into it. So that just to me makes it complicated as an example. It's entirely up to you. I mean, like, like I say, we can create a business model for absolutely any person, product or service that exists. But like you say, if there's a different way to make it clearer and the group agree, then I'm quite happy to change Big D into something more specific. Yeah. No matter which kind of music. Right. Yeah, you need a mic. So for me, um, my humble opinion is it doesn't matter which kind of music or because you can be a producer so it's about to identify which is your value mm. and how are you going to make like a profit out of it so i think that the business plan is straight uh, applied to the business mm. and what are we doing here is try to find big d value with the value you identify who is going to get this value and then you try to identify how are you going to make the money for these people. Yeah. And, yeah. That's in a nutshell. Thank you. That's <laughs> clear, concise description of a business model.
Remember, we said we started create, deliver, capture value. Just those three <coughs> things we're trying to do. Let, let's try not to overcomplicate this. If we look at it simply, it, surprising, it can be simple. It can be. We can't complicate. And I know where you're coming from, Kanisha, where you say it's a creative process, so we, should be, have, we shouldn't remove that creativity from it. It feels a bit cold, no, right? I, I it feels a bit cold, right? Just, no, I, no, I do, you know, I but... Do agree with, you do need to have a business plan, even if you're doing a producer, you know, um, producer, writer, which, whatever in the music field you're doing, you mm. still need to have a plan, you know, and I think that, you know, having a business plan, a business module is a very smart option because you can see, you can build the steps and you can, you can have a plan on where you're going to go in direction of audience, target, vision... There's a lot, it's better to be, have business involved in it than to just, you know, create music and not have any structure or any, anywhere to put it forth. You know, you can't just, it's, all, it's good, you know, the m important thing is music is important, but you still have to have a plan. And most people now are, that are doing music are business minded anyway, I yeah, think now. Oh a lot of them are. So a lot of them are. A lot of the people I meet are. A lot of people, the people that I meet are. business minded as it takes to consider the fact that they know they need to take further steps to get bigger, but they forget mm. how to um, risk assess everything they yeah. do and how to understand it or try to understand their target markets. People these days, they'll take a gig anywhere, yeah. they'll do it for free, not realising half the time, even the place they're doing that gig is full of people who don't like what they do and aren't well, the target market for them. I think it's not because what they do is bad, it's just... But that goes, in, that goes into a different uh, topic, that, that goes into a different topic altogether, really. Because with gigs, um, you know, you have, to, you have to have a structure and you have to have a plan. And you, obviously, me, as a, you know, I'm a singer-songwriter, I don't take gigs anywhere. You know, there's, there, there has to be, you have to have a plan, or you know where your audience is, where you're going. You know, you can't just take any old gig on the road. But then, you know, a lot of bands do take stuff for promotion. Mm -hmm. So there's a... a a plus and a Do you know how the Beatles started? Do you know the story of the Beatles? Do you know how they start? No, the, I mean how they actually started gigging, I should say. Sorry, that sounded a bit facetious. So Beatles, they, their first gig was in a strip club in Munich, which they played for two years, five days a week. Hamburg. 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 Thank you. Hamburg. <laughs> Hamburg. I knew I'd get the German town wrong. But they, they were literally playing four, five, six days a week sometimes for five, six, seven hours a day, covers over and over and over and over and over again. And it's said that that's why they got so good at performing live. Because they were performing to this crowd who, let's face it, weren't there to see them. It's a strip club. You don't come to see four guys from Liverpool. Sorry, guys, just quickly bring in a point. You said you're a singer-songwriter, so you don't just play gigs anywhere. Um, I'm a singer-songwriter, I play gigs everywhere. I played in like, literally everywhere. From caravan sites to yeah. proper venues to festivals. I played punk and metal for the last 10 years, playing literally, this wire's not long enough. <laughs> literally everywhere, you should just take every gig. You never know, you never know who you're gonna to play to. But the type of music I do, yeah. well, I, have, I take a lot of gigs that are more audience to face towards my music as well. But I also do gigs everywhere, Mm. True. Well, I'm, I'm not suggesting you take like. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, let's 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 go on. I, that's a beer, a beer conversation yeah. afterwards, I think, <laughs> in the pub. But I mean, fine, if it touches very much on my next slide. So, who are they? And what do they actually want? Which is, I guess, what you're both saying. Um, you're going for the surprise package. This is us. We'll play to you. We don't... We'll play anywhere to you. You're more selective. I know exactly what I'm about, so I'm very selective about who I give that package to. It's diff two different approaches. The same thing. So, Rick and, what exactly do the two of them want? And then, how do we get that to them? 
through what channel, what sort of relationship we have with them, and how much they're willing to pay for what it is we're giving them. That's it in a nutshell. That's why, I've, I, why I talk about simplifying it. Keep, start it off simple, then put the layers on top. Get the cake tasting right before you put the hundreds and thousands and ice and sugar and everything else on it. Because there's no point in having a crap cake and it's beautifully decorated. <laughs> So let's say, I'm going to pick one here. Let's say it's for the young people. Let's be really specific. They are between 12 and 15. They live in West London. It's a bit of a cliche because it's classical music, but hey. So that's our selected segment. So clearly they've got different needs. So this is our one segment. Remember, this is just one out of the list we've got. We're just starting with this one, then you just move to the next one, move to the next one, till eventually you can make an informed choice about who not to engage with and who to engage with. So you could keep going on with this list until you run out and then you pick the one where you want to start. Yeah. Would you count like in just like in the customer as well, like film companies and stuff like you know, and branding yeah. and all that? Or? Yeah. Absolutely. I was going to say this list could go on. You could have yeah. sponsors. You could have um, film companies. You might, Big D might want to get it filmed. And broadcasts, you might want to invite the broadcasters, journalists. The, all people you can get value from. So that's why I say where, you, where you're thinking of your audience, your customer, however you want to define them, keep making a list till you can't think of any more. Then ask somebody else, have I missed anyone? Maybe they'll think of a few more then you know the size of the potential of what it is you're doing. Until you do that, you, you're not really sure how big it is to potentially could be. Yeah. Uh, so what, one, one way that I was approaching it, and I realized, when, when I went to meet them in, in Cannes, it was a big festival, and, and everybody was talking about ways of making money in the music industry, right? And it was mostly uh, like producers, li people in licensing, and I realized that whatever they were talking about, this is where the money really was. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it. Mm. So I just made a, a list of four big areas of, of making money. One was licensing. 60% were people by licensing. Everybody wanted to have like music licensed or to find ghost producers or ghost writers. Mm -hmm. So eventually, you just write a song. You have no copyrights and you just sell it. You get, you get 15K like this. So that was licensing. A lot of people about that. It was about hardware. Um, it was Will I Am that he went online yeah. on Skype and, and he talked about that the music industry doesn't have any hardware. We don't own the hardware and we get it from other companies. Well, actually, if you have, for example, Beats, you have a very niche audience. You're Gothic. The Gothic people will never wear any commercial Beats headphones. You can collaborate with this brand and you can say, I got this audience. Why don't you create the headphones? the hardware, whatever this might be, and you tailor it to your community, your brand. This is another way. Mm -hmm. And you don't create something. And then the other one was platforms like Amazon, the long tail, you know, like having a lot of artists and getting a cut out of each transaction. Mm -hmm. And you can do the same thing with having an audience, you know, that they get connected about something and then you get a cut of it, out of each transaction or you have advertising or whatever. But a platform was a very big source of revenue. Mm -hmm. And there was another one which, oh, collaboration with brands. For yeah. me, brands look quite desperate for artists to make them look cooler. So you create your own profile. I mean, we all do stuff. We just realize that what is what I do? How, how can I describe what I do in one sentence? And then you find a brand that might look for this mm -hmm. to look cooler. Yes. So why am I saying all that? Because I realize that these big four areas make a lot of money. So what if I identify where, how you can make money today and then you find a way to connect that with your music? So instead of finding what your customers might be, you see where the money is, right? Instead of working for Starbucks, for example, you might say, I'm going to write a song that I don't really like about somebody I hate, but I'm going to make 15K, for example, instead of working for Starbucks. It's still the same thing. You're working for somebody else, but this is music related. So... I, I think it makes sense, and I'm, I'm going to go for it from September myself. 
Absolutely. Like going for somewhere, for a place where money is and I'll find a way to connect with my music. So it's like rever reverse engineering from yeah. what you suggest. Oh, absolutely. And this is why I say writing this exhaustive list is so important because once you've got an idea of the potential, then you, you've got options, you've got more options. But if you just know, well, selling my music to my fans, that's my only option, then that's all you'll do because you have no idea of what any, anything else you can do. As you said, Tommy, you have to know what's out there and know what your options are before you can choose which one to engage with and choose which one not to engage with. But how do you get there? Because some people are kind of scared of, by the fact that they feel they're not big enough for the brands to actually care about them or want to listen. So how would you get from there to there? You see what I'm saying? I do. It seems very big and far away from where we are. A lot of artists and producers or whatever feel like that. Mm. So what's the like building right? Yeah, I'm like, everyone's got to learn and it's I I like right. I still love it. I think that's just such a cool thing. So you know you need to be confident enough to do that by learning alongside other people who want to do it in your time at the same time as you. Sorry, thank you. So uh, that's what I think. See, put yourself alongside people doing it in real time, the same as you who would do that same example. Um, who you, loads of examples should look out on the net and see people say they they're really cool. They're getting really good Twitter following, social media. They're getting some really cool gigs. They're, they're my kind of genre and stick really close to them. And it's really inspiring to see them making their way as independent artists. And that's what I'd always say and like to do in practice as well. I mean, that's that's a really good way to do it. Yeah. and mine, basically, looking for background music in scenes and shots on TV. And when, whenever they use it, you get paid out a royalty, quite a large royalty, because obviously it's going to be going in a film or some kind of TV publication. But the music there they want is just something to really fit the scene rather than something from a famous person. So it doesn't matter how much um, of a fan base you have. And there's companies out there like Ditto up in Birmingham, who I worked with back when I was 15, um, who specialise in getting people who are really, really grassroots all over um, the licensing and getting all of the possible income streams sort of pegged so you've got a player in that court, in a sense. So maybe you just want to look for those grassroots sort of companies that are dedicated to smaller artists and smaller groups. Like, like anything, it's just about, it's just about um, charting a path somewhere and the steps that are required and being quite analytical and systematic about it. Listen, I think I think sometimes I think people we've got intellectually quite lazy because we've got devices at our fingertips that can tell us everything. Yet we don't know stuff. How is how can that work? We don't have to go to a library or look for books or talk. We can just tap it in and we can get the information. So to me, there's no excuse for saying, I don't know how to do that. Because you can type in, how do I do this? And someone will have written something about it. So <laughs> it literally is just understanding the way there and moving forward. But I've got a slide coming up that says, it's 44 ways you can generate revenue. And that's on the revenue stream. And I, I found that earlier this week. And I'll show you that. And as I said, all of them are quite broad and do require the steps being worked out. And I'm sure people could add another 40 or 50 ways to make money in the music industry. But again, they're all going to require fleshing out the steps to get from A to B to C to D to E to eventually you get to the money. And um, this is how we have to be quite systematic about these things and dis detach some of our emotional responses to it and be more cold with how we work with this stuff. You know, It's the only way, unfortunately. It really is the only way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Question from Thank you. Hi, Andre. Hi, so, uh, this is more, it's not really a question, but I just wanted to say something about 
It's interesting that you just chose the sentence of you have to be cold about it. And what I'm experiencing is that the most important thing that I've done, and I didn't do it because I knew anything about how I was supposed to structure my business, but I've just connected with a lot of people over the years. That's been like my biggest thing that I've always done is connect directly with anyone who's interested in my music or anyone who I'm excited about or whatever. And what I've seen happening, especially with the, the new technologies that we're faced with today, where we have these platforms that allow us to connect on a huge scale in a scalable way with almost an infinite amount of people, is that because of those connections that I've built over the years, I'm seeing hugely positive responses. And so I think one of the most important things, it's what I see value in terms of working out your customer segments is knowing who you want to talk to the most. Mm -hmm. In my case, I just kind of spoke with everyone and now I'm getting a clearer idea over time of who the people are who are most interested in who I am and what it is that I'm talking about through my art and through my music. And uh, the way that I'm sort of, what was it, getting value out of that is that I'm using a platform in particular called Patreon, which allows yeah. people to sign up and become patrons of my art. So support me on a monthly basis with whatever amount of money they want to give. And that's just to, for me to keep creating art. And that's a hugely powerful thing. But the only reason I can do that is because they value me as, a, as, as someone who offers them value. And I think that that's like the key part of all of this stuff is that it's not cold, it's warm, it's feeling, it's emotion, it's connecting. And it's like, you can, you can write as many beautiful songs as you want. There are so, I hear, I run two open mics, I'm involved in music every day and I hear the most gorgeous musicians all the time and a lot of them, no one knows that they exist. Because it's not about just having gorgeous music, it's about inspiring and connecting and being open and really talking to your audience in, an, in, an, in a feeling and authentic way. Auth being authentic, I think, is one of the key elements of what's gonna make anyone a success in this world. And so I feel like, yeah, it's like the business model, all of that is important, but revenue streams come from real connections. That to me is one of the key takeaways that I've had as an independent musician who's beginning to find some success through my music and it's because I'm connected with people authentically and I kind of just wanted to make that point yeah. that that's important. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thanks, Zach. Thank you. And, and Nate, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say because maybe my choice of word wasn't great when I said cold because actually what I meant was, which you actually are, is very focused and very systematic in how you go about what you do. Yeah. And, and this is kind of what I'm trying to allude to. You, you have to be. I was going to say that anyway, but it was yeah. interesting that you showed that sentence just before I spoke. Okay. <laughs> Trust you to choose the best chair in the room too. <laughs> sure. It's very interesting because, I mean, and I am originally from Italy and, you know, when you play live, you feel a form where you, where you say the songs you've played so that the Italian PRS pays you back, you know, a little bit, not much, but hey, I played lots of gigs this year and I've never filled a single form in UK. That, does it work like this with yeah. PRS? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Online? Yeah. Online? So just agreeing with that, um, I'm not an expert because I, I deal with loads and loads of artists. I'm sure you will be able to, or somebody, anybody else here in the audience can give you the information you need regarding PRS. But so many artists do not collect their PRS that I know. And it's something I learn, I'm learning like on a daily basis just by talking to different artists. That even people who've been in this business for years have like revenue they've never collected yeah. um, via PRS or copyright specialists. And I know loads of people, if anybody wants, you know, connecting, uh, who are really good who give free, their free time to kind of, you know, support you guys with a little bit of information about how to collect stuff like PRS. Historically as well, quite, you know, good tips. So, yeah, just get involved with doing that because that's really important. So mm, Yeah, that's a good point. And, and that's the thing, people can end up um, being so happy that they're being played that they forget to actually <laughs> make sure they're getting paid for being played. Um, it's a common thing I, I, I kind of seen with some of my clients. But I'm going to crack on through this second. I think we've done our customer segments in some depth. Something to remember, they are in charge. <laughs> we want what they've got, we want to collect some value from them, so they are in charge. And the traditionally how we define a value proposition 
is solving a customer problem or satisfying a customer need, whoever the customer might be, even if it's just a fan, even if it's a publishing company, even if it's a brand, it's about identifying what it is we can give to them. And, and if you notice this bit highlighted here, the value proposition is a bundle of benefits. It's about benefit you're giving, and that's increasingly true in the music industry. Now, you can't just give the music. People increasingly want more. They want the connection with you. They want the experience. They want to see you live. They want to have you in different formats. They, they want more. They're more demanding, expect more. So it's this idea of a bundle of benefits you're giving to whoever it is you're trying to deliver that value proposition to. Whichever customer segment Big D chose, she's going to have a different package for each one. Whether it's the young people, the sponsors, the venues, she has to identify what each one needs or wants before she can give it to them. I'm not sure I put that up. I suppose a definition of, it was a definition of a record company. It's probably a definition of quite a few people here today as well nowadays because you're having to do all this stuff yourself, right? Especially the marketing bit. 